Riffles are a fantastic place to target trout during the warmer months of the year. They are chock full of food and oxygen, which just makes them an ideal place for trout to hang out. On today's show, I'm going to walk you through how to identify riffles, and we're going to talk about some tactics that will help you start catching tons of fish from this type of water. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. And congratulations for tuning into this show. The most exciting thing to happen to fly fishing since the creation of the Adams Dry Fly, which ironically was created by a feller whose last name was not Adams. So go figure that one out because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. (laughs) Oh, anyways, kidding aside, folks, I am excited to be back here behind the microphone. As always, we've got another week of wonderful topics to walk through. We are going to be talking all about flies with spinners on them. Yes, that's a thing. We'll get into it in a minute. What you should know about sunscreen and bug spray and their potential impacts on fly lines. Some casting reminders and a primer on everything to know about the different types of leaders that are out there for you, uh, for your trout fishing and some bass fishing as well. So we've got quite a bit to go through this week, but before we start, I do just want to say, I mean, this is episode 50. This is kind of a big deal, right? We've made it 50 episodes into this thing. We're coming up on a year of being in production, and it's been a ton of fun. I just want to say thanks for all the support from everybody. We we really do love it. And just one other thing as well. I want to say we've been getting a ton of emails from y'all about when our starter packs would be back in stock. And I've got some wonderful news because we've been working our butts off lately and they are back in stock. So we've got starter packs ready for you. They are ready for Christmas. They're a perfect Christmas gift, actually. Uh, Everything that you need to get started fly fishing is in these starter packs. So if you're interested, I'll put a link in the podcast description. You can go check those out. And we really appreciate your support for the podcast and the support you show for VFC if you buy stuff from us, and hopefully that stuff's proven wonderful for you out there on the water. Okay, all that fun stuff out of the way, we're going to jump right into our short questions and kick off this week's show. The first one comes to us, Daniel from Iowa writes in, says, thoughts on baits with spinners on them. P.S. Baja Blast is the best Mountain Dew flavor. Daniel, you're you're 100% right, I think, on the Baja Blast, but I, I kind of go back and forth. I really love the Whiteout Mountain Dew as well. It's just, oh, it's such a solid, crisp, clean Dew flavor. Uh, I could do an entire podcast on Mountain Dew flavors. Maybe I need to. Maybe I'll branch out. It'll be part of the VFC Podcast Network, <laughs> our Wings and Mountain Dew podcast. Well, anyways, Daniel, I have seen the flies that you are mentioning Uh, I think the brand specifically is called the Pistol Pete. And really, uh, if you've never seen these flies before, folks, if you're listening or watching the show, uh, if you're watching, hopefully we'll stick a picture of them up in the video. But it's literally just a fly, but then it's got a little propeller on the end of it. Like, think of what your nymph would be. And instead of a bead, like a bead head, it's got a propeller. And so it spins around. So it, it was interesting. I remember the first time I saw these things. and. I had no clue what they were, like, was it a gimmick? Is this actually real? Do people use these things? I didn't know. Uh, I've actually never used them myself. And these were, it seems like these were developed to be fished uh, on spinning rods behind your bobbers, but apparently a lot of fly anglers use them too. I was doing some research on this, and there's quite a few fly anglers who believe in these little flies. There's even a tying video on YouTube on how to make these yourself. So I reckon it's worth giving them a shot. And I think, you know, if we're going to call a squirmy wormy a fly, then we probably ought to consider the pistol Pete a fly too. Just, you know, let's be honest here. If the squirmy wormy is a fly, I think the pistol Pete is as well. So interesting, interesting question there, Daniel. I appreciate it. And if you haven't seen those flies with spinners on them, look up the pistol Pete fly. It's really, really interesting stuff. 
All right, our next short question, Jeffrey from Massachusetts writes in, says, I hear a lot about chemicals negatively affecting fly lines. What are your recommendations for insect repellents and sunscreen, and also how to safely reapply them on a long day of fishing? Jeffrey, great question. Thank you for sending that in. So sunscreen and bug spray, they do have some chemicals in them that can act as a solvent, which if you get that all over your fly line could definitely not be a good thing. You don't want to dissolve that coating on your fly line. I don't know that it's going to immediately wreck your fly line. Like you got a brand new fly line, you get some sunscreen on it, and then the fly line just sucks immediately. I don't know that it's that uh, immediate, but it certainly can speed up the demise of your fly line. I've also heard anecdotally from some guides that you never want to have sunscreen on your fingers when you're tying your fly on because that'll put the fish off. I don't know. I, I thought quite a bit before I answered this question, Jeffrey. I don't know that I've ever seen that direct correlation between sunscreen or bug spray on my fingers and then fish refusing that fly. I even thought back to when I was in Alaska uh, just a couple months ago fishing for grayling and we had to put bug spray on and then I tied flies on and I, I didn't notice an issue, but I know guides who swear by it, so it's probably safe uh, to not only worry about getting it on your fly lines, but worry about keeping it off of your flies as well. So my best advice here is just thoroughly wash your hands after you put sunscreen on or bug spray and before you touch your rod, real line of flies. When I'm out on the river, I, I do this myself. I wash my hands before I touch my fly line if I just put sunscreen on. Uh, I usually just dunk my hands in the river for a few seconds and wipe them on my shirt. That's probably why all my shirts make me look like I'm a two-year-old because there's all bug spray and and sunscreen just rubbed all over them. It's wonderful. Uh, but <laughs> that's what I do, and it usually uh, helps me be good to go. So hopefully that helps you as well. All right, folks, make sure you've got your Diet Coke and or Mountain Dew, something to sip on because we are going to launch into the main part of this week's show. The Chase from Texas is going to start our show off for us this week with his question. He writes in and says, tips for regaining proper cast techniques when swapping rod weights in a single outing. I typically use a nine foot five weight, but while traversing to and from many of my prime spots, there are narrow areas with a very low hanging trees that I can't resist busting out a six foot three weight, which works really well for me. The problem is that if I cast that rod for more than a half an hour or so, when I go back to the nine foot five weight, I might as well be swapping to my throws like a girl left arm. I know it's a haul and timing thing, but I can never seem to recover good form. I've even tried just casting low weight rods with left arm and larger with dominant right arm. Nope, I'm basically a fiddler crab in that respect. I need to use the same casting arm. Chase, this is a really interesting question. I, I really do appreciate you sending this one on into us. I think what you're describing here sounds to me like a, a classic case of overthinking your cast. And I do not mean that in any negative way at all. I find myself overthinking my cast a lot, especially when I'm throwing really big streamers and I'm using sink tips. Just was it last week or the week before? It was couple weeks ago at the most I was out fishing with a buddy of mine and we were swinging streamers in between the good nymphing spots and I pulled the streamer rod out and I've got a huge articulated streamer on there and a sink tip and I haven't cast sink tip or streamer in a while just because I haven't fished streamers in a while and we're in the drift boat too so it's always a little bit different out of the boat and I go to cast and <laughs> I was I was overthinking it so much, mostly as well because my buddy that I was with, he's never fished uh, streamers on a sink tip out of a drift boat before. So I was trying to show him, like, this is how you do it. And then I'm stripping the line out, and I'm making my cast, and I'm overthinking it, and it looked awful. And I'm like, yeah, this is how you do it. Do it like me, the idiot that can't remember how to do it. So it was kind of frustrating, but my my timing was off. I was slapping the water behind me a little bit. And it, it was all because I was overthinking my cast too much. I wasn't just picking the rod up and casting. At, at this point, it's muscle memory for me. And, and you'll get that way as well. 
uh, any angler will. You do this enough. I've been doing this, oh, going more more than 20 years now. I've been fly fishing. So I, I've been out. It, it, it's a little bit ingrained, you know, but even even at that point where I, it's something that I'm so used to, if I start to overthink it, I do notice that my casting performance will just plummet. So my best advice here is to remember that the rod does the majority of the work during a fly cast and not you. You are simply there, your, your entire job in a fly cast. It's real simple, which is good because the less intelligent among us, I'm pointing directly at myself, uh, need things as simple as possible if we want to have any success with fly fishing. So your job, real simple, all you do with your cast is you need to move that fly rod in a straight line. You want to keep the tip roughly between 10 and 2 on a clock face. We've all heard that analogy before, I'm sure. If you're brand new and you haven't, we've got a how to cast video that I'll link in the podcast description. Go watch that. You'll understand what I mean. So you got to keep your rod tip in a straight line. Keep the tip between roughly 10 and 2 on a clock face. And then make sure that you're making your casting strokes at the correct time. That means after the loop has unfurled on each casting stroke, then you move the rod forward. You don't want jerky motions. You don't want too fast of motions. You don't want too slow motions. You just want a nice smooth casting stroke in between. So that that's your job. It's really simple. When, when you boil fly casting down to its essence, it is really simple. So focus on the basic mechanics of your cast and listen to what your rod's telling you. Something I see beginning anglers struggle with a lot at times is that they don't know how to interpret the feedback that a fly rod gives them. They don't know what a good cast feels like versus a bad cast. And that's fine. You're a beginner. You're not expected to know that. But if you can pay attention to how it feels when you get a good cast versus how it feels when you get a bad cast, that'll tell you, okay, something's wrong. My mechanics are busted down, so I need to I need to look at what that is, fix them, and then just go back to casting. Uh, a good fly cast, and this this is critical. A good fly cast should feel really smooth. It should feel easy. If you feel like you're doing a ton of work to make the cast happen, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, if there if there's a hitch or a any kind of a jerk in the casting process, then there's an issue with your casting mechanics. Last week, uh, or no, a couple weeks ago, that same trip uh, with the streamers, we actually put the streamer rod away because the dry flies came out. And I was making some really long casts with dry flies with this rod that I hadn't fished very much before. So I wasn't, I wasn't used to how the rod felt at distance. So I was, I was almost having to just not relearn, that's the wrong phrase, but I, I was having to pay a lot of close attention to how that fly rod was acting when I was getting these these dries out to 50, 60 feet so that I knew that my timing was down because each rod's different, each line's different. They're all going to behave just a little bit differently. So even, even with my lack of experience with that rod, though, I was able to feel the, the line load, and there's almost, it's almost like a hum that you feel that tells me that it's under the right load and that it's working at its peak performance. You'll, you'll notice that in your fly rods. So recap here, focus on the basics of your casting, let the rod do the work and pay attention to what the cast feels like so that you know, if you're making mistakes, the fly rod will tell you if you're making mistakes, you just got to listen to it. And again, we have an episode of our a uh, beginner fly fishing masterclass that's dedicated to casting. And I go over a lot of these tips in detail. So definitely check that out. I'll stick a link to that in the podcast description. And Chase, hopefully this answers your question. If you need any more clarification or you need anything else from me, please don't hesitate to write on in. Thanks a bunch. All righty, this question comes to us. Sam from New Jersey writes in and says, Love the show, learning so much, and sorry for submitting more than one question. Sam, never be sorry for submitting more than one question, all right? I love getting questions from more than one folks, or more than one folks. I'm a little tired today. I love getting questions from more than one people, more than one person. There we go. I finally got the right word. Goodness. 
uh, because it's nice. We build up a little bit of a relationship here, and it's it's fun. So it it makes it feel more personal for me that I'm actually connecting with folks and helping them out. And that's the whole goal of this show anyways. So never feel bad about sending in more than one question. Send a bunch in. Send them all in. Man, we'll help, we'll help you out. Anyways, back to Sam's question. The creeks I fish are not that wide and pretty shallow. I usually walk them fishing the pockets. However, I have unfortunately literally kicked a large trout sitting in rough riffles. How do I fish those riffles when they sweep my flies right through them? I love a dry dropper, but the changing water makes me need an indicator that I can change depths often. Any tips? Well, Sam, this is a really, really good question, and this is the question that I teased in the hook for today's show as well. We're going to talk about some riffles, and I really think this is worth digging into, so buckle up, all right? Like I mentioned in the hook for today's show, riffles are arguably, well, they're they're one of the best places. I won't... I don't know. I, I if I was you know like gun to my head, I would say riffles and runs. Oh, I'd probably pick a run just because there's a little bit more cover for larger fish. But riffles are really, really good places to find trout. They've got a ton of oxygen in them, which means that during the summer when the water warms up and our dissolved oxygen content decreases, trout will go into the riffles where there's more oxygen. They'll hang out there. And that extra oxygen also means there's a ton of more bug life in the riffles as well. So there's more food available for the trout. So it's got everything they need, oxygen and food. They've got cover from overhead predators because the the riffly surface of the water kind of helps camouflage them better than a pool would. So it it's just the perfect place for trout to hang out. Right? It, it's, it, it, it's hard to beat, right? Now, uh, riffles are typically going to be where you're looking for fish from late spring through early fall. Fish will move out of the riffles into slower water during the coldest months of the year. Uh, me and Alex were out fishing just a couple days ago, actually, and we we kept looking at some of the riffly water because we expected to see some fish on reds, and that would have been great because if the fish were on the reds, that means that in the big pools and the big runs below those reds, uh, there's going to be a lot of fish stacked up and, and hanging out because uh, you, you don't want to fish to to fish that are on reds. And we'll, we'll get into that at a later date. But anyways, this was November when this happened, and the fish were not in the riffles at all. They were all in the deeper runs and the pools. Alex even hooked into some really big stuff in some almost dead water. So... Uh, this time of the year, they're, they're out of the riffles, but late spring to early fall, they are going to be in those things thick. So I fish, Sam, I'm going to fish a dry dropper rig through these riffles almost all the time. I think I've mentioned, uh, <laughs> a lot on the show, how much I love the dry dropper rig. It's my favorite way to fish. Now your riffles are going to move quickly but they don't move so fast that they should be sweeping your flies through them. So that almost makes me wonder for a minute, Sam, if maybe you're fishing the fastest, more rapid-like sections of the riffles instead of the more gentle riffles where trout are most likely going to hang out. According to a bunch of research and some excerpts from Tom Rosenbauer's book on this subject, fish prefer to hang out in water that's moving at about two feet per second. If they are going to feed, they want to feed in water that's moving at about two feet per second. That's a little bit above walking speed. So water that's just kind of meandering along. It's not too fast. It's not too slow. It's just perfect. Riffles move at about two feet per second, which is why they're such a great piece of water. So you should be looking for water at that's moving at that speed to fish in first. We actually have an in-depth story about riffles on our blog. I'll link that in the podcast description as well so y'all can take a look at it. Riffles are uh, another way to identify the riffles is they're going to have that choppy, bouncy surface as well. They're going to have almost no white water in them. So if you're seeing white water, you are fishing in water that is moving that is probably moving way too quickly for there to be many, if any, fish hanging out in them. So that would be my first concern, Sam, is that 
I'm sure you've kicked large fish out of riffles before, but maybe the riffles that you're trying to fish are just moving a bit too quickly for fish to be holding in them. So now we know what a riffle is and what we're looking for. We want that walking speed water about two feet per second. How do we fish these things? What is the best way to go fish a riffle and come home with a whole bunch of fish? Pictures, because we leave the fish in the river. We don't come home with fish anymore. Oh, I feel guilty sometimes when I keep fish, and I know I shouldn't. It's a it's a dumb thing to feel guilty over. I mean, if the resource allows for it, you harvest some, you eat them, they taste. I grew up eating a lot of trout. I think they taste great. Uh, you know, there's some fish I would never keep and some places I would never keep fish from. But anyway, that, that's, a, that's a whole other podcast episode. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today. <laughs> Anyways, as I mentioned earlier, a dry dropper rig is my go-to for getting into the riffles. Sam mentions that his flies are getting blown through the riffles too quickly, and that can be a problem if your flies are just too small. Personally, my favorite dry dropper rig in the summer is a bigger chubby Chernobyl, so like a size 10 or a 12, and then a long dropper. I like at least two feet of tippet for my dropper down to like a size 16 or 14 Frenchie or Paragon. That That's just my go-to rig, especially on trout water. It works. Sometimes I'll swap that that uh, chubby Chernobyl out for an elk Arcadis or an Adams if there's a lot of mayfly type bugs buzzing around. But I always keep that two foot distance between my first fly, my dry fly and my dropper. Uh, th- and that's important. And I'll get into that in just a second. But it is important that you set your rig up correctly because your dry fly needs to be buoyant enough that it will float without getting drowned or tossed around by the riffle. And then you also want two feet of dropper down to your nymph, which should be a heavier fly, because you want that that nymph to have enough time and enough space to get down even in the faster water of the riffle it needs to be able to get down and be right along the bottom and if you if you choose a short piece of tippet it's never going to get down enough and it's never going to be quite right down there on the bottom two feet i've found is a really good starting point and then you can trim it off or add a little bit more if you need to at that point So your rig needs to be set up right. After you've set up your rig correctly, the next step to really, really do well in a riffle is cast upstream of it so that your dropper has enough time to drop to its depth before it gets into the riffle. You want that dropper down in the strike zone before it gets to the riffle so that as your fly is going through the riffle, it's in the strike zone the whole time. This extends your drift because once the nif enters that riffle, it is right there in the strike zone so if you're in a riffle that's short enough that you can cast above it and let your your nymph sink and then bring that dry dropper into it that's gonna that's really going to up your catch rate in riffles and riffles almost as a rule they maintain a pretty consistent depth if the riffle starts to become too deep then they turn into a run and we've got a series on that on the blog you can check out as well so you shouldn't have to adjust the depth of your dropper too much once you've made a run through a riffle a few times to see if, okay, it needs to be a little bit deeper or it needs to be a little shallower, right? It would be deeper if you're never getting down at all. You would need to add a little bit of length to it if you're not snagging up on anything. And you would need to shorten it if you're snagging up on every single drift. Shorten it just a few inches, and that should probably be enough. Again, I've found that two feet is about the perfect length because it's long enough to reach the bottom of most riffles, but not so long that it's always catching on the rocks. Now, if you need extra depth and your local regulations allow it, then tie on a second dropper. So you've got a dry dropper dropper, right? We're, we're, we're going a triple threat. We are, we are not messing around here. We're going to catch some fish. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a really deadly way to fish. I love fishing three flies. I, you know, we're able to do that here. Uh, It presents more opportunities for tangles, certainly, but I think it's just a really effective way to get flies in front of fish. I actually had uh, a couple of people, I wrote an article about fishing three flies, and I had a couple of people in the comments just get real nasty. One guy 
just lit me up. So, oh, well, if you're fishing three flies, you might as well just fish some bait. And no, don't, don't listen to those people, right? You're just covering as much of the water column as you can. So if your local regulations allow it, I know in, well, I don't know, but I, I believe in British Columbia, I don't think you can even fish dry dropper in British Columbia. I think your single point flies only in a lot of places up there. So check your regulations before you tie three flies on. Uh, Yellowstone Park, for example, I'm not too far from Yellowstone and fished it last month. And they don't allow uh, more than two flies on your rig. So dry dropper is all you're limited to there. So check the regulations. But if it allows it, a third fly can help you get some extra depth in that riffle if you need it. So to recap, how do we effectively fish a riffle? Well, make sure you're actually fishing a riffle first. Look for that kind of choppy water that's moving at about two feet per second. There's no white water in it. It's not going to be too deep because if it's really deep, it'll be a run. It's not going to be too shallow, okay? Because at that point, that's not a riffle. That's just gravel with a little bit of water going over it, (laughs) all right? Set your dropper at least 24 inches below your dry fly. Make sure your dropper is heavy enough to sink quickly. Tungsten beads are the best to use here, so I would highly recommend that. Cast ahead of the riffle to allow time for your dropper to sink into the strike zone before it enters the riffle, and then tie on a third fly if you need the extra depth and your local regulations allow it. Hopefully, that gets some answers coming your way, Sam. Uh, And if you need any more clarification on riffles and some good ways to fish them then don't hesitate write us back on in i'd love to answer another question from you jeremiah from arkansas writes in and says hey guys hope y'all are doing good my question is what's the difference between all of the leaders like furled leader nylon leader mono leader and fluoro leaders thank you can't wait to see this on the show jeremiah Great question, and you're seeing this on the show, so congratulations. <laughs> I do apologize if it took me a minute to get to your question. Uh, we, we've got quite a few that I'm working through, but don't let that dissuade anybody from sending questions in. We need them. All right, that's what keeps the show going here. Anyways, different leader types, it's it's pretty simple. It's it's not this arcane, crazy world. So once we explain it, should be we should be good to go. In general, you've got three types of leaders. You've got a nylon leader, a fluorocarbon leader, and a furled leader. Now, we had a listener write in a couple of months ago, and he kind of got after me for how I would interchangeably use nylon and monofilament. A nylon leader and a monofilament leader, we use these words all the time. We, we use them to say like, oh, do you fish mono or fluorocarbon? Well, technically, a, mo- a mono leader or a, pardon me, a nylon leader. I'm making the mistake again right here. A nylon leader and a fluorocarbon leader are both monofilament. Mono means one, so it's one single strand, all right? Uh, what a nylon leader is, is it is a single piece, so it's a monofilament leader that is not made from fluorocarbon or coated with fluorocarbon. They are made from a nylon Material. They're called monofilament sometimes, like we said, to help differentiate them from fluorocarbon, but that's not the technically correct way to use them. So I'm going to just talk about your nylon and your fluorocarbon. All right. Your nylon leaders, they are fantastic for dry fly fishing because nylon has pretty good knot strength. It's hard to see when it's on the water and it floats. That's the key thing with nylon. It floats really well. So this is what I reach for when I'm dry fly fishing, no matter what. Fluorocarbon leaders, on the other hand, are fantastic for nymphs and streamers because fluorocarbon is a little bit more invisible in the water than nylon is. It also sinks and it's got a lot of abrasion resistance. So that makes it an ideal choice to use when you're nymphing or fishing streamers because you're always bumping along against rocks or other snags and fluorocarbon handles that abrasion a lot better than nylon does. Now, what about furled leaders? Well, this is where things start to get really kind of interesting. And I I do want to make a caveat here. I have never fished with a furled leader. I know a few folks who have. So I'm not speaking from personal experience here. I know what they are, and I've seen them in use. I've just never used one personally. A furled leader 
is made by taking a bunch of strands of material and braiding or twisting them together. Uh, braiding is probably not the correct word because a, a lot of furled leaders don't have a hollow core like you would see if they were truly braided, but I think that's the best word to help help y'all visualize what it is. Uh, what happens when when you braid all of these different strands together, though, is you create a really dense leader that is supposed to be stronger and a lot more supple than a monofilament leader. Uh, often furled, furled leaders are made from thread with the idea that thread doesn't have the memory that nylon or floral carbon do, so there are no permanent twists or kinks in the leader. This means that all of the energy from your fly cast is transferred directly from your fly line through your leader to your fly. So in theory, you get better presentations. They're a little bit more subtle and you don't have any random line memory issues taking energy away from your fly cast. Now, a furled leader is typically going to be shorter than your traditional monofilament leader and they're going to have a tippet ring attached to them at the end. This is where you'll attach some monofilament tippet. If you're fishing with dry flies, you put your nylon on there. That will finish off your rig. So it's not a full leader. It's most of one. And then if you think of, a, if you think of your typical tapered leader that you buy, the furled leader is the thick, thick, thick section of that. And then you would just put the tippet section onto that yourself. And it's connected with that little tippet ring. The idea here is that you're not cutting up into the thicker sections of the leader like you would with a monofilament leader. You just go up to that tippet ring and replace it when you need to. So furled leaders should last you a lot longer. Again, they're going to improve energy transfer. And I've heard a lot of folks say that they lift on and off the water with less disturbance, which helps create a better presentation, especially for dry fly fishing. Now, again, I've never used furled leaders, so I can't say one way or the other, but they do seem like they're going to be some extra work because, for instance, you do have to add floatant to the entire thing if you're going to use it uh, as uh, your dry fly leaders. I'd prefer not to do that. I'm kind of lazy, uh, if y'all haven't noticed. <laughs> That's probably pretty apparent in some of the advice I give. It's, it's the fat guy's way to, to being successful at fly fishing. Uh, any, anyways. Again, I'm just going off what I know of furled leaders, but if anybody has some experience with them and would love to add that to the show, please do leave a comment right on in. Let us know. I would love to hear what y'all think about furled leaders. Well, the show's not over yet, folks, because we are going to do the tip of the week again this week. Uh, if y'all haven't tuned in for a couple of episodes, I decided to ditch story time at the end. I just don't think it was uh, an effective way to help teach and to help y'all become better anglers. So we're going to go with tip of the week instead, which will still incorporate quite a bit of stories. But it's a chance for me to share tips directly from the fishing that I've been doing lately. So hopefully it's a lot more timely and a lot more relevant than just hearing me blabber on about some fish that I didn't catch a while ago or something like that. So this week's uh, thought of the week, not t I, I probably said tip of the week, didn't I? Well, Alex is always doing tips of the week on, uh, on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube shorts. So I blame him for, for getting me mixed up, but it's my thought of the week that I want to share with y'all here. Uh, Alex and I were out fishing actually a couple days ago. And the big thing that I took from that well, I took a couple of things. One, Alex is in much better shape than I am, which should surprise nobody that's ever seen us on the podcast before when we do our podcast together because I'm, I, I need to lose a few kilograms at, at this point, a few pounds, kilograms for our international listeners. Anyways, uh, Alex moves around a lot more to both explore and find new places to fish and just to cover a lot more water. He's a lot more willing to grind to eventually find bigger fish than I am sometimes. I, I kind of get hesitant to explore new water. And I think part of that just has to do with, I have a lot less time to fish now than I used to. So when I get out on the water, 
I really want to just go to where it's about as close to a sure thing as I can possibly get. And I think that's detrimental to my own fly fishing because I'm not pushing myself to explore and to become better and to find new places. And Alex does that for me. So I I do love when he and I get to get out and fish together because we go out and he pushes me to be a much better angler. The example, we were on uh, this river here in Wyoming, and it's a river that I've fished for, uh, oh, shoot, probably a decade now. I know it very well. I love this river. It's my favorite river in the whole world. And there's section, there are entire sections of this river that I've never even seen. I've never fished them because I kind of go back to my spots, and I've fished the first 10 miles of it pretty well. I'd, I used to float it in my drift boat. And uh, I, I know a good chunk of this river, but there's parts of this river that I've never seen. And Alex wanted to go to a part of this river that we'd never seen before. So we get down in there and the water type wasn't looking quite right. The fish were in very specific types of water. We'd learned that the day before. They were in not slow, but not fast. It was this, it had to be this like perfect in between. It had to be deep enough. They were uh, they were very, they were very particular about where they wanted to hang out, and we had an actually spectacular day down in this new section of the river. Alex caught a pretty nice brown. We both caught a couple of cutthroat down there, which is not common. Alex caught a big cutthroat, actually, which was really really beautiful. And then once we finished exploring that new section, we ended up going up river a little bit and going back to a usual spot and we did not catch anything in the usual spot i ended up having to leave a little bit early so i could get back up here for work and alex stayed and he's like as we left you know we're like hey i'll see you later alex is like i'm gonna go try this one other bend real quick and see what happens well he calls me like an hour later like dude i caught so many big fish and he had a bunch of big fish break him off but they were in a completely different type of water than what we'd been been fishing all day. So Alex, again, he was he was showing the importance of grinding to find fish and not being satisfied and trying to explore a little bit. So that's my thought of the week for y'all is don't be afraid to go find some new places. It's not the end of the world if you only catch a couple of fish. I had a lot more fun traipsing around this new section of river with Alex, even though he made me walk through sand. And it was a lot of extra work, and us fat guys don't like to do that. <laughs> but no, I, I had a lot of fun. I had more fun doing that with Alex than if we'd just gone to the usual spots and had it be really slow, like it probably would have been. So that's my thought of the week. Remember that. Try and push yourself. Explore some new spots. You're not going to regret it. And As a reminder to everybody, if you enjoy this show at all, if you found the show helpful, please, please subscribe, share this on social media, tell people about Untangled, rate us on Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening. That helps a ton with getting the word out. We really need your help to spread the word of Untangled. We're hoping that we can can really reach a bunch of people and help them have success out on the water that's our goal here at vfc we want every angler to have a great day out on the water so do your part share this show tell people about it and if you've got questions remember send them on in there's always a link in the podcast description i want to answer your questions so please don't hesitate if you've got any send them to us and until next week get out on the water have some fun the tight lines everybody 